Hello and welcome to the attacker's point of view and what to do about it. So in this talk, I want to give defenders the chance to see what kind of information probably is out there and what kind of information they they need to see themselves. And with a talk like that, where we're talking about what could be used for attacks and everything, of course, I will have to make a disclaimer or two. And this disclaimers are for you if you're doing that for your own company. If you are a hired red teamer, then you have to adapt them a little bit. And I will talk about these not in length, but you need to know what you what you what you really should keep in mind. So the attacks and techniques and things I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes. Please use them responsibly, use them with your own company, and preferably have some kind of permission in writing from your company that this is part of your job and that you should do that. Why is that? Well, even if your boss thinks it's cool, um, not everybody might be on board. And very often I found when talking to people that HR departments have a different understanding of what is allowed to do and what not. So this is really just to secure your position. And again, if you're looking for lost information on the internet in any kind of shady service, let's say you have a secret project called Secret Project. I'm boring here. Um, but let's say it's a unique name that you don't that you have associated with something very new and you want to find out whether this has been breached and whether this name is out there, then of course, please do not enter that confidential data like the project name in any shady service, because if it hasn't been leaked before, then it will be leaked afterwards. Always keep that in mind. And if your company is just a little bit like every other company, then people in the higher ups especially will want to have the services running smoothly. So if you're doing anything that could disrupt service or production or bring a server down, then please, um, you should really schedule a change for that. You should be very open about what you're doing and always keep the impact on your organization in mind. That was a little bit for the, for the organizational boring part. Now, the motivation, I've talked about uh, the motivation just a little bit before the presentation started. Why should you have a look what's out there? The thing is, as defenders, uh, we very often are focused on the insights. So whatever is coming into our networks is suspicious and we have to have a look at that. And very often we think that whatever is out there, breach credentials or anything, we can't do much about that. So why bother? The bothering thing is, if you do not know what you need to protect, then how can you protect it? If you do not know what kind of information is out there and how a crafty person could find out things about your, your company that you thought were hidden, how are you going to protect against that? So I really think this needs to be done by, uh, by people. You should have the same information that an attacker has potentially. You will never get to 100% because it's the internet, it's the darknet, and so on and so forth. Information will be hidden. But my personal view is that even if you get a glimpse of what other people could see, you can prepare. And motivation part two, of course, is I don't know about you, but sometimes it's really interesting to think about how to burn your company down to the ground. Not that you would want to do that, but just to think about how would I, as an attacker, actually do stuff to, to hurt my company. And that is not meant as being a disgruntled employee who wants to burn everything down. It's really just, well, how could I do it? Could I do it? And where are my weak points? And this exercise in mind, I think, brings up a lot of good avenues where you could do some, some research on. And I also need to be clear that this is not a part of protection. 
relying on protection only, your firewalls, your IPSs, your good, cool, new security device that you bought at the last uh, conference or, or RSA or wherever won't really protect you 100%. And everybody knows that it's, it's become a cliche that 100% uh, protection is impossible. And it's a myth, and I'm not telling you anything new, but you can get closer to that mark. And you have to, in my opinion, you, you have to put detection and a little bit of reaction in the mix as well. Because protection alone, I was in the mindset 10 years ago that protection is enough because what do I care what happens outside the parameter of my firewall? I wouldn't even put an IDS sensor outside the firewall because I just didn't care. What doesn't get through the firewall doesn't get through the firewall. Um, this opinion has changed a little bit. I am interested what happens and doesn't get through the firewall because it might give me some really interesting insights. And I'm very much interested what happens way outside the company's parameter um, in terms of intelligence and in terms of information that's out there. And again, the parameter as we know, it doesn't really work with bring your own device with mobile working, especially in these times now where everybody's working from home. So don't rely on that. Also, please don't rely on the thought that your stuff might be unhackable. It feels a little bit bad to bash John McAfee now that he's in, pr in prison. But basically, nah, I never really feel bad about um, bashing his... Uh, the, the things he said sometimes. And one of the things that was big two years ago or one and a half years ago was the bit fee where McAfee said it was quite unhackable and it has been proven within a few days or weeks that this wasn't the case. Unhackable doesn't mean anything because if it's not just, if it's, if it's something that runs code, if it's something that runs on hack hardware, uh, somebody will find a way to hack it. So don't rely on that as well. And another myth, and the last one in that series, is that nobody is interested in your company. That might be the case. If you're not manufacturing something brand new, if you don't do anything that is really special, you might come to the conclusion that nobody really has an interest in your company. But the bad news is, as soon as any of your stuff is connected to the internet, people are interested in your company. Maybe not in the stuff that you do, maybe not in the intellectual property that you have, but in your hardware and your resources. Because if they can capture one of your servers, they can use these resources to do other attacks. So if you're connected to the internet, people are going to be interested in your company. A big point in that whole attacker's point of view for me is physical security as well. But within 45 minutes, I don't really have time to cover that topic. It's also one, not, not necessarily my strongest point, but there are really good talks out there about that. I only brought one small video uh, that we made in our office to just show you how easy it is to open doors. If you haven't seen that, um, it's well worth a watch. So basically, this is just a piece of wire and a piece of iron. And the fun fact is that uh, most doors have the same height. And this is locked from the outside. Well, it's, but it has this mechanism that you can always open it from the inside in case of a fire and everything. And this, you have to believe me, we took only one shot. My boss hasn't done that very often before, and I didn't cut the video. Well, you might say uh, it's a glass door, and so it was easier, and you'd, you'd be right. But still, it was just on the first try. So it's easy to get into offices. And I urge you to think not about people who want to steal stuff, but also about people who want to leave stuff there, like microphones, hidden cameras. And physical security is something you should have a think about, but it's not the focus of this presentation for the next few minutes. In order to know what to protect, we should also have a look uh, at whom to protect against. 
And I've made this really ugly graphic, and I apologize for that. I should make a nicer one uh, about types of attackers. I basically have constrained myself to two axes, which is the target on the x-axis and the skill of the attacker on the y-axis. So with everyone being a target and low skills, you would have the group that is typically referred to as script kiddies, whereas I have to say, who isn't a script kitty nowadays and runs stuff from GitHub um, that could do the trick without really writing their own code. There are people who are writing their own code and kudos to that, but they are not in the low skill, skill range. Going further on the target axis, if it's not everyone, like everyone would be affected in something uh, like the Hafnium, if you're running an exchange server, you are in the group everyone because you're just vulnerable to something your business sector might be targeted by if you're a bank for example might be targeted by specialized groups who usually come with a higher skill level and if the target of the attack is your company and your company alone because maybe you have some intellectual property that somebody really wants uh, the skill level of the attackers very often is also quite high one thing I'm also not going to talk about is the privileged insider who sits within your company usually and has a high skill level, but we're looking at the company from the outside and the inside we leave to other people for this kind of presentation. So I have a networking background. When I look at a company and when I look at what I could do to cause harm, I will always start with the basics, and that is for me the network layer. And for that, and for all the rest, I would ask you to have a dedicated machine from where you are running your attacks. Even if that is, or especially if that is for your own company, you shouldn't have a company machine because you want to have the same view as an attacker who sits outside the company networks. So have a dedicated machine with its own DSL line, with its own network access, without any kind of trace back to your company networks. This is also very good if you are surfing shady sites and don't want to be associated with your company. Um, the next step that should be done is also talking to the people doing the log files and getting at least read access to your CM and your log files. CM if you have an integrated uh, log, log machinery in place. But what you want to do at the end of the day is also have a look what your attacks look like within your CM, within your context, within your log files, so you can prepare accordingly and write alerts for that. And the final thing that is a basic thing to do as well is you need to be very open in internal communications and hopefully be friendly with everyone. Because this is not about telling people what kind of mistakes they make and laughing at them. This is about helping the company getting more secure. And especially if you're doing things that could potentially disrupt services, you need to be open about that because there's nothing worse than getting called to the war room or whatever you call it, uh, where the C-level is assembled because there's an outage and you having to admit that you caused the outage because you tried something. Uh, that never really makes you any friends. Scanning your networks, if you're not familiar with it, it's easier than you might imagine because there are enough tools out there. Just to scan your network, I would ask you to try out Nmap or maybe even MassScan. These two tools can scan any network quite fast and will give you open ports and show you what services might be running. Throughout my presentation, I have uh, slides with links like this, and I'm not going to read them to you, but these are for further reference. If you never have touched Nmap, really you should give it a try but this is all done from your machine right so it's your pc it might be a dedicated thing 
but still you are running it from your machine and your IP might show in the logs. If an attacker is good enough, they probably wouldn't use an IP that can be traced back to them. So of course we can call in the specialists. There are enough and way more services than I wrote down here um, in, available for you that let you port scan any machine, any network, and give you valuable information. The good thing about that is that usually what you can do is when you use those services, uh, your IP won't show up in the logs. But for our exercise, the IPs of central ops in, in that case or others will show up in the logs and you will see what their scans look like so you can prepare accordingly. And you should keep in mind that IPv4 is not the only protocol out there and IPv6 can get port scans as well. Um, not going into IPv4 versus IPv6, but a complete port scan of an IPv6 network will take you too long to, be, to make any sense. But again, uh, you will know where your servers are. So you will have the addresses and you don't have to guess, you can scan them accordingly. That's all good. And I'm not saying that this shouldn't be done, but is it enough? I mean, probably not. So you can employ even better specialists like Shodan and co. If you haven't heard about Shodan, and I'm assuming you have heard about Shodan, but just for the sake of those who might not have heard about it, uh, it's a self-styled search engine for IoT devices and uh, for machines where you can basically find vulnerable machines um, very quickly. So one very prominent example are webcams. If there are unsecured webcams from someone, um, well, from, from some company that are vulnerable for um, or have a weak password that has been leaked, they are on Shodan and you can probably connect to them and watch the videos they are recording. I would, again, being one of the people on the, on the lawful side, I would urge you to uh, counsel with your law, um, or what's it, your law department, if you have one or some counselor in, in that regard, if you're allowed to do that. Because basically, if you watch other people's feeds, it might not be a gray area in your country. It might already be illegal. But it's very good to look up what's on Shodan um, regarding your own company, if there is anything. And Census and Sumai are very interesting as well. These are, I would say, like Shodan, but Sumai, for example, is a Chinese service. And funnily enough, if you look long enough, there's stuff that Sumai will pick up and Shodan won't, and vice versa. And Census in the middle is also something you could have a look at. All these services so far are basically free um, for a few scans. You just have to register with an email address. Here, I probably also would take some kind of email address that is not associated with your company because you want to separate what you're doing from your company. Uh, but it is easy enough to get an email address nowadays, isn't it? So is the sky the limit? I don't know. Um, I had one guy who told me that he's protected against those Shodan attacks because he blocked the IP addresses of Shodan, which I think is not as ingenious as he probably thought it was because there's too many services anyway. And it's not about hiding that you're vulnerable. It's basically closing the vulnerabilities that you have and being aware of those that you can't close. And port scanners are quite limited as well. You could hide services by doing something like port knocking where you just have to connect to a few arbitrary ports and then the real port will open. No company does that. A few private people do that, but it's there. UDP services, you will probably not really find those because it's 
in the nature of UDP that you won't get a response if your packet arrived or didn't arrive. You could be a victim of a wrong banner. So if the Apache says it's version X, Y, Z, and it's not really that version, you are looking for vulnerabilities for that version. So port scanning has definitely quite a few limits. That's why you can go even further. And apart from just port scanning, and I know Nmap and others will do more than just port scanning, but real specialists like Nessus or OpenVAS will go one step further. They have proof of concept exploits that would actually trigger vulnerability. And um, then you can confirm that this vulnerability really exists, that the port scanner didn't give you any wrong information, but that this vulnerability is there and you should do something about it. Um, Nessus is a paid service. I think the free version currently is limited to 16 IPs. And uh, OpenVAS, of course, has uh, is free. It has a bit of a learning curve, but there's enough documentation and videos out there to get you up and running in no time. Yeah. And I've got one honorable mention for that whole thing, and that is robtext.com. I found that while looking for, for sites that could give me information about my company, which is a DataFDE, and just feeding the domain name into robtext.com came up with that graph detailing all the DNS records, MX records, A records, NS records, and how it all works together on our machines. And I had to smile, to be honest, because if I went to the network engineers and asked them to draw me a picture, it wouldn't be as nice as what Robtex did within half a minute. Um, so yeah, go ahead and check out Robtex and see whether it's doing a good job and whether you are aware that this structure really is what you think you are running. Because very often in this whole detection thing, it's not about, um, well, it's about not trusting the policies that you have in place, not trusting the setup that you think you have, but actually proving that this is the setup that actually is running on on your networks. Now we come to some more unconventional methods of gathering information. You've probably had, have heard about paste bins. There are lots of them and they basically work like the copy and paste clipboard under Windows, only that that is remote and you can copy some information, paste it into a paste bin and anyone with the right link can read it from there. So it's not really for file exchange. Very often it's code snippets or shorter text files because for, for files, there are other ways to exchange them, but it very often is quicker to send, uh, to, to use a paste bin and send the link to somebody than to send him the text file. And uh, they, they do have a use. They are also being used for shady stuff as well. So, a few years ago, if you had a data breach with passwords and usernames or emails, very often you would see it end up on Pastebin, which is one of the most prominent sites, or one of the others. Again, these are example, examples only, Kleber and Ghostbin and Pastebin, they all exist. Pastebin is still a very interesting place because it allows you to scrape stuff. If you registered a pro-life account, which comes at something like 30 euros or something in, in, in that price range, not very, very expensive. You can then set one IP that is allowed to scrape anything that comes into Pastebin. And then you can run a script that just looks for your company name or anything interesting that's coming in on one of your machines. Here, for example, you could use your secret project name and look for that because all the information is on your server and on Pastebin, of course, but Pastebin won't know you're searching for that because you're grabbing on your own server. Unfortunately, a lot of the other services do not allow scraping. So there might be something on there, but you might not know about that. Another thing to have in mind are breaches. And by breaches, I 
mostly mean password breaches. So when LinkedIn gets hacked again, or Adobe or any of other of the services, usually and very often people will be logged in with their own email account, with a personal private email account. But with services like LinkedIn and others, sometimes they might be business accounts. Have I been pawned is one of the sites where you can check whether your email address has been leaked in one of these breaches or not. And it will tell you which breaches it was in. So for you personally, it's of course a very good idea if you have been in a breach to change your passwords uh, for that site. If it has been a company email address, then you need to ask these people also to change their passwords on the affected site. Let's stick with LinkedIn. I, I hope that's okay. And of course, any other site where they use the same password, because even if it's hashed and salted, it's out there now and people might be able to crack the hash. So it really should be changed. Have I been pawned will allow you as a company to do a domain search for all the users' uh, email accounts from your domain. You can set that up and there are other companies as well. I am mentioning Leak Checker here because they try to do it in a way that is absolutely okay with the um, with data protection acts and they will only store hashes at their site so they can't know whether your password is in there or not unless you provide them with the email address and they have something in place, but it's, it's a German site. Um, if you speak a little bit of German or can run it through a translator, it will work as well. And of course, uh, the Skull Security Org has password files. Because if your password is not unique, and spoiler alert, it probably isn't, then it might be on there. There's one file called Rockyu that has more than 14, 14 million passwords, real passwords, and it doesn't matter if John Henry from Oklahoma used the password and it's now in the open together with a hash and you're using it too uh, because you thought of the same password. If it's out there, it's out there. Have a look at that. Very interesting are code leaks as well. And those might be inadvertently or they might be legitimate questions. For example, I found a configuration for our DNS servers from I think 10 or 12 years ago where one of the admins basically asked on GitHub um, about a configuration issue and whether this is right or wrong. And well, it's going to stay there. So have a look what kind of code is out there. And GitHub sometimes also has code that interfaces with your services. For example, if you um, offer an API for some kind of service that you're offering, there might be scripts interacting with that API. And those scripts might have API keys in them if people weren't really careful about that kind of things. And this is something to bear in mind. Stack Overflow and GitHub can have a lot of information that you don't want to have out there or where you have to see whether you can, in the uh, case of the, of the API key, whether you can issue a new one and make sure no secret keys are in, in GitHub. Another thing that is a really valuable source of information are sinkholes. And usually your company won't have a sinkhole, so it's a good idea to go to a partner. Shadowserver.org, for example, is really cool. You can register your company for free if you have an AS, for example, meaning an autonomous system where your networks are rooted. And they are operating a few sinkholes. If a bad domain is well known for uh, command and, and control traffic, for example, the provider might actually link uh, uh, forward the DNS request to the domain name to a beneficial sinkhole, which means the, ad, uh, 
the traffic from the affected clients gets sent forward to benign server and not to the malicious command and control server. And so the benign server sees what kind of clients are infected and try to communicate with them and then can inform the company that they have infected clients. It's a really very well done service and it's very valuable. And if you haven't registered with a shadow server for your company, you probably should. Then there's the whole can of worms with deep web and darknet. Of course, if there's information that's valuable, that's being traded, it's probably going to be on the darknet. And there's not much you can do about that except for employing help from outsiders. But I'm getting to the point later on in the presentation. For the moment, uh, just know that a lot of the information that can be found on Google, well, or say Bing or Google, it doesn't matter. But all the information you find there is just a fraction of what you can find if you know the correct link, if you are logged into the, to the right forums, and so on and so forth. But whatever is on Google, you can have, a, have fun with that and try to find out stuff that you don't want to have on the internet or where you should be aware of with Google Docs. If you haven't heard about Google Docs, it's just employing Google and using a few more advanced search parameters like in URL, which means the URL in that case should contain something like um, the password file and in text, in text of the machine, you, uh, in text of the website, you look for something like root x00, which is, and you probably know that uh, the, Password entry for root, usually the X signifying that the password is in, in shadow. And you see here that I get a web page that doesn't really look great, but there is something in very small print that gives me all the uses on that website. Probably wasn't intended that way. With our own web page, since we're a German company, I used something like Geheim, which means secret in English to see whether there's something that is obviously classic, classified and exploit, which told me whether there is an exploit available. And this is really just on the well-known Google sites. So uh, sites that Google indexed, um, there's more info out there. And you can get into uh, Google Docs really easy. I've provided a few links, have a look at that. It's a lot of fun. And if you don't find it on Google because somebody took it down, there's still Archive.org. Archive.org uh, uh, has the, the Wayback Machine where I can see old instances of web pages, which is really cool if something, for example, um, uh, gets abandoned and you still need info from there, but before it got abandoned, somebody deleted all the content. You might go to archive.org, use the Wayback Machine, and actually see the content. It's very nifty, very good, except if it's information you don't want to have on the internet. But again, then you will have to change the bit of information or try to protect against that. A lot of stuff also is going on on social media. I'm not really just talking about shitstorms and things, but just about chatter. For example, if you usually don't see any chatter on social media about your company because your company doesn't have that kind of flair like Nike or any other big company, and all of a sudden this number rise, rises from two, three mentions a day or a week to a few hundred or a few thousand, then you know something is up. Either there's something with the same name as your company that is trending, or something really, really needs to be looked at. In order to be present on social media and in order to actually check Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds in an automated way, there are a few things you should consider. And the one thing are sock puppets, which means basically accounts that are not your real name, accounts that are not your real phone number and what have you. Because again, you probably don't want that account associated with you 
or with your company. The only problem is, and I should make air quotes when I say problem, um, you need to think about whether you care for the terms and conditions of that website uh, because they very often do not allow sock puppets or false accounts. But let's take Facebook, for example, a company that has not really big problems to do with your data as you please. Well, check your own mor morals, check your internal guidelines and of course applicable guidelines and uh, think about whether you use your real name for sock puppets or not. Another thing that can be employed to quickly find out whether somebody is interested in your company especially and whether there's a human trying to sniff around are honey tokens. Honey tokens are a little bit like honey pots, but not on a network level, but on a whole lot of different levels. So for example, you could have a Word document that should never be opened because it's not really linked from any of your web pages, but it's, it's there if somebody looks for, I don't know, secret.docx. And in this Word document, you can embed a canary token. So when it's opened, um, you will get an email that tells you this document has been opened and a little bit more information like that. I'm really a fan of canary tokens. Uh, check the website out, please. And what you can do with it, you can embed them in a lot of interesting and different ways. You could do your own stuff, of course, as well, but why bother if there's already a really cool solution out there? And there's a shameless plug about a whole talk about uh, I did about honey stuff. If you're interested in that, please feel free to check it out or contact me afterwards. I'm happy to talk about that as well. If your company is big enough, there's another problem. And that problem being that marketing departments or others might actually buy domains or web space with third parties and never tell anybody about it. So with us, for example, the whole process of getting a server up and running with a domain name and web space for some is too cumbersome. So they open up, um, they, they buy something from a third party and run their web, website there, very often through an agency. And if you don't know that there's information about your company on a legitimate site that's not under your control, then that's bad, basically. What you can do, one of the things is periodically scan for your company name, see whether this is just your site and so on and so forth. And there are feeds about newly registered domains, which will give you all the domains that have been registered on a given day. You can search that for your company name, of course, and probably get an insight whether it's running at your site or not. And now we're we are getting from stuff that can be done via open source and free methods to stuff that is more complicated. For example, if someone already injected your website with malicious JavaScript, probably most companies won't notice that, especially if a lot of people are working on the website and if it's updated constantly, if it's not static, and uh, there might be some malicious stuff running without anybody ever knowing. What can you do about that? You can scan for all the malicious stuff that you know of, uh, but then you also have to deobfuscate all the JavaScript. It's very often very well hidden. And this is a point where we're starting to need some kind of professional help, which means there are a lot of companies out there for everything I talked about, there are companies out there who will do it for you. The problem is they also want money. So if money is a little bit tight, you should think about what you really need and where you need the professional help. And also it's a very good idea to compare a few products before you decide for someone because there might be, um, one of the company might give you way better results than another company if you are outsourcing security stuff, but getting professional help with 
say the websites and malicious JavaScript, I found that something that I needed to have because I couldn't do it. Which brings me to one of the major pains in security anyway. You probably should prepare a budget for 2022 if you haven't already that takes a few of these things in account. Some of the services are quite cheap, meaning in the hundreds or in the single thousands of, of euros, which in, in company terms is quite cheap. But these things easily go into six figures if you want something that contains the word cyber and has probably people checking, let's say, the dark net for anything that comes up that has to do with your company. And I'm not bashing those companies. Basically, I think it might be fair because if you're browsing the darknet, uh, you need to speak at least a few languages like Russian, Chinese, maybe Korean, just to get an understanding if there's anything out there that is of interest to you and you have to maintain personas there as well. So there's only a few people who can offer a really cheap price on that, but most are quite pricey. But a lot of the stuff can be done just with your, your time, a little bit of elbow grease. And um, I hope there were some things in there that you can use. Feel free to contact me afterwards. My email address is, uh, as you can see, Stefan Hager at Dativ.de. I work for Dativ.de, which is a German company, and we are doing services and software for tax accountants. And this is always a fun part because other countries seem to handle their taxes better than, than us in Germany because we, we are really a big, very successful company and we need that because our tax laws are really quite interesting, as you could imagine. If you think Germany is bureaucratic, you haven't had a look at the tax laws is what I'm saying. But I'm starting to babble because it's all done and finished. I would like to say thank you to you for your time and for listening and to all the people who provided pictures for that presentation. And then I would like to return control to the host and I'm looking forward to your questions, if there are any. Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I actually found it very interesting. Let's Thank see you. if there are any questions on the chat. I do not see any further questions on the chat. So if something shows up later, our speakers know how to access the chat. So maybe you can just ask it over there later. Mm, and we will now take a little break. Our next talk will be at noon. And we will be doing some fun stuff with firmware. So stay with us. And for now, thanks a lot, Stefan. And thank uh, you for having you me. One in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye.